we are producing a new apartment every five hours. So every five hours, another apartment gets completed. And just doing that, breaking this into smaller batches, getting everyone work, working together, we can actually take a construction project that might be 15 months and drop it down to six. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Are you struggling with growing your real estate business? Are you tired of begging the banks and hard money lenders to fund your real estate deals? Well, search no more. My guest today is going to reveal how he has transitioned from borrowing money from the banks to borrowing from private lenders. And he makes the rules, not the lenders. My guest, Mike Kading, uses private money for single family and apartments as well. So if you want to get plugged into private money for your real estate deals, you're at the right place right now. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm so excited as to the guests that I have on the show here with me today. First of all, he is on a mission to dominate, yes, dominate the multifamily industry by delivering absolutely the best construction cost to value in the industry. I mean, he knows how to think outside the box. Uh, he knows how to analyze data. And quite frankly, he has some of the most innovative ideas of anybody around in the industry. In addition, I guess, is a residential real estate builder and developer and he and his team are transforming, really, the way apartments are being built today. I mean, they are actually changing the way construction is done. And this has resulted in much higher quality construction and, along with that, lower cost projects. Their mission in today's market is to solve America's housing shortage by transforming the way apartments are built and managed. And... In doing so, they're going to be improving the way all of us live. We're going to be meeting my guest, Mike Kading, right after this. Well, Mike, I'm excited to have you on the show. You know, you and I have got a lot in common. First of all, you are going through and you have been going through the pain of borrowing money for your projects from somebody else that makes the rules instead of you making the rules. You've done a lot of research in this world of private money when it comes to how you can spend money on advertising to raise private money versus networking. And so really at this point in time, you are at the point of transitioning on where you're getting your funding. So let's go ahead and dive into that, Mike. What kind of pain? Well, first of all, let's back up. So you've done residential, you do commercial, you do multifamily, you do apartments, you know, you do more than one asset class of real estate. Tell us about the kind of funding that you've been using for those classes uh, of assets so far. And uh, what have you experienced with that? Yeah. Thank you so much, Jay, for having me on your show. We traditionally use construction lending or just bank lending in general. And this has been pretty good for us because our cost to value or the cost that it costs us to actually build the buildings is fairly low compared to what the value is when it's complete. The challenge is in the last, I don't know, six to nine months, we've seen banks go from being willing to provide a 75% loan to value all the way down to 55 to 60%. And so for us, now we're in a bit of a pickle. We need to bridge some of that gap in order to get the financing we need to build our projects. Yes. Yeah, so uh, would you say one of the biggest differences in today's market with funding 
uh, given the sources that you have, you know, been doing business with, is is it the interest rate or the interest rates higher that you're experiencing, and or you just said you got to bring more down payment to the table and and as they say, have more skin in the game. Yes. Yeah, so as interest rates rise, there's something called the debt service coverage ratio, which might be a bit technical, but basically that ratio that banks use is a bit conservative in this kind of market, which basically drives down what they're willing to give you for financing. So I think you mentioned in your book, having to go to banks and basically pleading with them, asking for those funds. It's, it's very true. I, even a year or two ago, we had a project. It was a $60 million project. We went to banks and we went to 60, six zero different banks, calling them every single week, every single day for months on end, trying to get some banks to work with us. And uh, since learning about you and learning about your program, it's just it's, it's eye opening to how much easier it can be using private lenders rather than the traditional banks. Yeah. Well, you know, the list is long, as you have already learned. The list is very long as to why to use private money versus institutional money. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, how about go ahead and share from your perspective, and I'm sure it matches up with mine now, uh, since you've been reading my book and following my podcast and all that. Um, what's the difference that you now know? What's the difference between actual true private money and institutional money? Is so a private money comes from individual investors. It's people that you build relationships with. Or institutional money, it, there's gatekeepers, and they've found their own investors, and you're having to go to them and, and ask for those funds. It's a they've got a lot of rules. Some of our bank deals will take a year, a year to close. And the closing documents, I, I've been there, spend like four hours in closing documents, and they're a pile of paperwork this thick. It doesn't have to be that way if you've got the right relationships directly with private lenders uh, in your neighborhood. Exactly. But I tell you what, let's do, Mike. I know that we have got a lot of listeners that are thinking to themselves, well, where in the world do you find these individuals and how in the world do you make the rules? And this is like, you know, when I first heard about this world, Mike, all the way back in January 2009, I never heard of this world until then. I thought to myself, wait a minute, this is a 180 degree shift in my thinking and in the way that I had been doing business. I relied on local banks to fund my deals from 2003 to 2009. So let's go ahead and give our listeners a gift right now. And that is, I'm so excited. I just finished writing my guide, my money, private money guide called Seven Reasons Why Private Money will skyrocket your real estate business and help you build incredible wealth. And this guide will get you onto the fast track to getting private money the way Mike and I are talking about. And that is you make the rules, you set the interest rate, you set the terms. And guess what? I never take any down payment to the closing table. I always bring home a big check when I buy a real estate uh, project or property. And so if you want to get on the fast track to private money and you be in control of your business in the driver's seat, you can download this for free at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. That's jayconner.com forward slash money guide to get on the fast track to private money. Now, Mike, you and I were talking uh, and visiting previously before we started the show about how you have researched that you can raise private money by actually spending money <laughs> to locate private yeah. lenders, get them, you know, finding you. By the way, I've never done that. Um, but but tell, share with share with me the research that you have uncovered as to advertising for private money, which by the way is open solicitation, and you can only borrow from accredited investors when you do that. Uh, whereas the way I do private money, you can borrow from anybody. What's the difference as far as what you've learned so far? Yeah, it's really interesting when getting into it. Uh, the SEC has probably a dozen or so exemptions 
to not having to file as a public company. And this lets you go raise money in different ways, including advertising, which you can't traditionally do. So that, that sounds advantageous, right? You have a bigger pool of people you can connect with. You are limited to accredited investors. There are some cases where you're actually not, which is kind of interesting. The challenge though that we've found is that it costs about 4% of the capital you're raising in finding those investors. So if you're raising $100,000, then you're, you're costing you about 2,500. If you're raising 250,000, then it's $10,000. One of the magic, one of the kind of the interesting, powerful things about your approach, Jay, is you're building relationships directly with people. And if you can build those relationships in a way that doesn't cost you $10,000, this is a great approach. And that doesn't even include all the costs with the SEC registration and filings and uh, things that you have to do that just add on additional costs. It's, it's, it's an amazing strategy that you've put together. Yeah, well, thank you, Mike. Well, I'm so glad we found each other. And I'm so glad you're not going to have to spend those kinds of dollars to now raise private money. So tell us, Mike, about your business, your company, which is called Norhart. N-O-R-H-A-R-T. And um, we're actually going to give um, my listeners here an opportunity to get a pretty nice return on their investment capital because I know what your website is. But first of all, what is Norhart and how did it come about? Yeah, we design, build, and rent apartments. And we're really transforming the way this is done by incorporating technologies and techniques that have revolutionized other industries. And as a result, this drives down the cost and increases the quality of our projects. If you look at the past 60 years, manufacturing has improved by 760%. Agriculture, 1,500%. During that same time period, construction has done nothing. Well, 10%. It's been essentially flat. That's out, to me, is a bit outrageous. And I think that we have been finding ways of driving down those costs. Uh, what's really interesting is my, my parents did start the business about 30 years ago or so. And about 15 years ago or 10 years ago, my dad suddenly passed away, which is really tough. But in that moment, we had an opportunity because we started realizing that our lack of knowledge in the space or my knowledge in the space it was a bit of an asset because we started asking, how do we do things differently and apply lessons that other industries have done? And so we've seen success here. We're about 20 to 30% lower construction costs than the very best we've seen. We think we can drive that down to 50% or lower. And imagine someday what that could do. That means someday your rent could be half or your mortgage could be half. It'd be amazing to work to solve that affordability crisis we face in America. Well, now, Mike, you have done a fantastic job rousing curiosity <laughs> uh, by, mention, by mentioning lowering you know, construction costs 20%, 30%. Uh, there may even be ways to reduce the cost by 50%, while at the same time uh, maintaining or increasing the quality. And, you know, when you talk about being able to lower rents or, you know, sell houses, uh, you know, or have a mortgage. I mean, you never hear of mortgages, you know, and, and rents going down. So, so can you pull back the curtain just a little bit mm -hmm. and share with us what are, what are some of the techniques and strategies that you and your company Norhart are employing to achieve lower cost and increased quality? How do you do that in the world of construction? Yeah, so one example is construction is a very broken up industry. You have the owner, which is typically different than your developer, which is maybe different than your general contractor who coordinates all of the construction, who can be different than your subcontractors, the people actually doing the work, who can be different than your suppliers so sourcing materials for you. And what's, what's really interesting is those different groups don't work very well together always. In fact, I was meeting up with uh, one of the unions not too long ago, and they were interested in working with us. I said, okay, great. If we brought you in as a union for the plumbing, does that mean we can use the electrical union to source people? And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. I'm like, well, guys, do you play well in the sandbox together? And his, his response to me was, 
Good fences make good neighbors. This is not a recipe for creating a great, efficient work process. I see it all the time. And we were faced with it decades ago where there's fighting and challenges and difficulty that happens to that. Imagine if a construction company were to build cars. You would have a different company doing the windshield, a different company doing the steering wheel, a different company doing the door. And then, of course, the door company, they'd be a few days late. You would call them up and be like, ah, we'll get there in a couple of days. And, and then they would hear that you only want them to work on one car at a time, which is crazy to them. And then they would say, no, I need 100 cars before I'd even come out there. In manufacturing, they look at us and like, they were crazy. Uh, but just bringing in house enables a level of cooperation you don't normally get. And then that unlocks really cool stuff. For, uh, for example, in manufacturing, Toyota produces a new car every 55 seconds. In construction, we don't have any such notion. <laughs> Maybe we're completing a floor every couple of weeks or something like that. We are now, as our company, as, we, as we're applying their techniques, we are producing a new apartment every five hours. So every five hours, another apartment gets completed. And just doing that, breaking this into smaller batches, getting everyone work, working together, we can actually take a construction project that might be 15 months and drop it down to six. So to bring a construction project, say, from 15 months down to six months, are you using the, the, the same labor force, but you're just yeah. uh, arranging the relationship differently? Uh, how, how does that work? Exactly. I'll give you one example. Drywallers hate, hate it if anything is in their way. So they want an entire floor cleared out, everything done, so that they can put their drywall in super fast and leave. The downside with that is that means you have an entire floor not being worked on. If you take that floor and segment down into one unit and get everyone coordinated well, so they're only working in their one unit, you never have an entire floor not being worked on. So you can work on the whole building at once. Uh, it's kind of crazy if you go out and see our buildings. On one end of the building, you have completed units that can be turned over and residents can be living in it. You look about 200 feet down the building and you see dirt because there's nothing there yet. So you just condense that whole window down so you can produce at a faster rate. So what would you say are the main factors that is driving the cost down? Obviously, if you're able to get it cash flowing uh, quicker, that reduces your carrying cost, mm -hmm. right? Before that, become, but are, are there any other factors other than reducing carrying cost? Yeah, so another one is supply chain. Most times uh, we just buy, you know, construction people buy from the local suppliers or people they have a relationship with. The reality is you can get better products at a lower price point going further down the supply chain. So we have staff who work and live in China. We have staff that work and live in Mexico. And a lot of these products come from those sources. But if we can buy directly from those manufacturing sources, we cut up two or three levels of middleman in that process and get our products just at the right time at a lower cost point. So that's another example. There's probably about a dozen or so ways that we do this. So um, does the phrase vertical integration play into this? And if it does, Absolutely. explain what explain what vertical integration is. Yeah, vertical integration is when you bring a variety of disparate uh, entities together to complete one task. And so for us, we are the owner, we're the, we cornered all of the construction, we do all the subcontractor uh, work, we have electrical, plumbing, HVAC, all in-house, all those laborers in-house, we have the supply chain in-house, we even have manufacturing facilities in some cases to com produce components for our buildings. And so going very deep like that is vertical integration. It's scary, it's hard. Most people like to stay in their niche, but we're looking at this very disparate industry and say, how do we bring it together so that we can improve the efficiency in the way we do our work? So you have done, you've employed this type of strategy with apartments, right? 
Uh, has this, does this apply at all to new construction for houses? Absolutely. Yeah, you could do it for housing, you could do commercial. In fact, I think housing would be one of the easier ways to do it. But uh, certainly, you could do it throughout yeah. the industry. Would you say you're an innovator of this idea? Yes and no. <laughs> I think the big thing we've done, I, I think the best innovations is when you take ideas and concepts from other groups, other industries, and you tie it all together, right? And that that is what we have done. And in that sense, we're very much innovating in the sense that maybe it doesn't feel like innovation is we realize that we don't know everything. So we fight very hard to find the world's, literally the world's best people and bring them together to come up with these sorts of crazy concepts. We have people who, who are so good at what they're doing that they're, they're the best in the whole United States. They live in Florida, and we actually fly them up every week to Minnesota. It's like a three- or four-hour flight every single week to work to fly them back. But, in, but when you're thinking at that kind of level, if you're finding the very best people, it, it doors unlock, and you can create crazy new stuff. Wow, that's amazing. Now, I know that you have an opportunity because one of your URLs is www.norhart.com forward slash invest. Yeah. So talk, talk about what is the investment opportunity? Yeah, so what we are doing, a couple different paths, but the primary one is we're building an investment platform. And what this is, is it will feel a little bit like a bank account. It's not actually a bank account, but it will feel like that. It's not FDIC insured. It's actual investments in hard real estate. But you can put money in. You can take money out. You can put money in and lock it for a period of time and then take money out for a higher interest rate. So it's, it's a lot of taking your principles, Jay, of private money lending and trying to open it up more to the masses and make it more accessible to the masses. So we actually... The way we're approaching this is through something called a Reg A, which does not require accredited investors. We do have to be audited. We do have to go through the SEC. So it's going to take us another six months to build this out. Uh, but that's sort of the primary avenue. And then we have a secondary avenue, which is very much following uh, your course, uh, your your book and your approach to uh, raising capital. That's awesome. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to, and I tell people all the time, Private money, whether it's for single family houses or whether it's for commercial deals, it's all the same money. It's all the same money. It's all the same. Could be some of the same people. It's just a matter of how you structure the deal, how you structure the offering. And, you know, you said something towards the beginning of uh, our visit here on the show is that, you know, the traditional way in borrowing money is going to the bank and getting on your hands and knees and putting your hands underneath your chin and going, oh, please give me a mortgage. Please give me a mortgage. Please lend me money. And But in this world of the way we raise private money and now the way that you're raising private money, um, you know, we're not begging. We're not asking. We're not chasing. We are teaching people about this opportunity that they have. And, you know, they, they, I mean, they're chasing us. I mean, prior to COVID, Mike, I don't know if you uh, have heard me say this statistic, but prior to COVID, there was $18 trillion in cash and just people's retirement accounts mm -hmm. sitting on the sideline. Yeah. It wasn't used. Now, this side of COVID, $31 trillion in cash, right? Sitting on the sidelines wow. and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. So it's yours and my responsibility to relieve them of that problem and offer them opportunities to where they could get high rates safely and securely. So in your platform, and I'm, and I'm so glad you did the research to where uh, in the platform that you have, it does not have to be an accredited investor. By the way, why don't you go ahead and share what is the definition of an accredited investor and your investors don't have to meet this criteria? Yeah, and credited investors mean that you are making $200,000 a year as an individual or $300,000 a year as a partner or spouse, or that you have a million dollars of net assets excluding your home. So if you meet one of those two criteria, you're an accredited investor. There's a few other ways. If you're professional, you can also become an accredited investor, but that first one's the main point. 
And of course, a non-accredited investor is any investor that yeah. does not meet the criteria of an accredited investor. So with your, in, uh, so, so answer this question first, then I got a follow-up question. So would you say your investment opportunities with Norhart are safe and secure? And if so, how so? Yeah, so it's, it's actually very similar to your approach. What we're doing for us is if you look at the capital stack, this is where money gets invested or where money comes from for a project. Typically, our projects, they're funded first with bank loans. And then after that, we put our own equity into the project. We're basically, for this vehicle, we're introducing a middle tier. So this middle tier is, is a little bit more risky than the bank because if we lose our money, the bank gets paid back first. But as the general partner, as the primary equity at the top, we're taking most of the risk. And so we might have that first 25%. So the deal have to go down by 25% before the preferred equity ever gets touched. Um, so that's, that's how we provide some safety to our investors. That's wonderful. So how would you describe your ideal investor and how can they find out more about the investment opportunity? Yeah, the ideal investor is someone who wants a good rate of return that uh, doesn't want to take on a tremendous amount of risk. Our goal is to reduce the risk in these things a lot like Jay has done uh, through your, your system. But to reduce that risk down for people, uh, we're looking for a good rate of return on that. Wonderful. And then, well, yeah, Mike, going to uh, our, go ahead, Mike. Oh, yeah, going to our website, uh, norhart.com and clicking on investment on the vest, you can sign up for a newsletter to get updates as uh, updates come out with that platform. Awesome. So that website for, uh, to learn even more about how to get um, high rates of return with Mike and his company, by the way, Mike is the CEO of Norhart, just so you're talking to the guy that's in charge. Uh, website to learn more about how to get those high rates of return is www.norhart, N-O-R, H-A-R-T dot com forward slash invest. That's Norhart, N-O-R-H-A-R-T dot com forward slash invest. Mike, thank you so much for the time to, uh, for your time, for coming on here to join me on the show. And any final words before we wrap this episode up? Uh, thank you so much for having me. And Jay, I, I really have to hand it to you. Your book, your classes, your insight is really impressive. So for any of those that are interested in learning more, definitely engage a lot with Jay. He is a, he is a master in his space. Thank you so much, Mike. God bless you. And thank you for coming on. Thank you. Well, there you have it, my friend, another episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm so excited that you decided to join me here on the show and I need your help. I need for you to just think of one person to share this episode with that uh, you think they believe or you believe they would get value from it. And if you happen to be um, listening on iTunes in the upper right hand corner, three dots, hit those dots and just tap follow so you don't miss out. And in addition to that, if you happen to be watching or listening on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and click that bell so we get you notification of when we go live on the next YouTube. I'm Jay Connor the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business to the next level, and we'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.